guy who I was sharing studio space was uh, doing a, a, a album compilation of surf vintage surf music, and he had contacted, or the uh, art director had contacted Leroy Grandison, got a big stack of his photos, and once I saw those, it, I went back to that place in time saying god i remember that photo and these are so cool and there's got to be a book here somehow I'd like to say you know for almost 40 years or 40 plus years i've been going to the flea market uh at 5 30 in the morning i get up at 5 30 and i'm i'm usually on on there at 6 30 because you have to if you want to get the best stuff it's, it's when they're pulling it out of their cars um, and so over the, over the years, I've developed relationships with these folks. So there's people who come on a regular basis and they go every, you know, they're there every week or every month and, uh, they know who I am. And so we've struck up conversations and they'll say, well, what are you looking for? And then they know what I'm looking for. So then they'll start when they find stuff, they'll hold it for me and they won't let it out to someone else. So that's the good thing of the, the repetitiveness. And they know if you're a good customer and you buy stuff from them, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna hold stuff for you. I still really enjoy it. It's it's uh, it's one of those things that um, I look forward to um, every Sunday because you don't know what you're going to find. You know, it's, there still is this thing of, you know, what is you know what's going to be there? What are you going to find this week? That's a little bit of a problem only because my my collecting range is really broad. Inevitably, I'll bring something home in those those 40 some years that I've been looking I think I've only come back from the flea market uh, with nothing twice The other aspect was I, I loved the history behind the objects. They just weren't appealing visually, but it was also the history that was behind it. So when I started finding stuff that related to LA's history in terms of paper ephemera, that fed even more. It's just like, wow, I didn't know that that place existed, but it was on a match cover, it was on a brochure, or it was in a scrapbook that I found, and that kept spurring, you know, more interest. So one that would be the most most interesting to me would be the history of nightclubs in Los Angeles because that had all the, you know, my parents' stories could be incorporated into that. I was discovering, you know, uh, playbills and catalogs and photographs. And I specifically went to the library looking for that stuff uh, and talking to the librarians and they would lead me to other places and other archives and uh, going to microfilm and sitting for hours and hours and hours in front of the microfilm machine trying to find all of the history of all these nightclubs uh, by virtue of the newspaper. So that was kind of my zen uh, moment would uh, be to go to the microfilm room uh, and spend eight hours straight without getting up looking at microfilm. Then, you know, I would find the newspapers at the flea market and then there were the, the, on the microfilm would be the ads and I would buy the newspaper and I'd have the actual ad. I'm completely aware of the fact of the historical significance of the stuff that I collect and the depth of certain subject matter that I've collected because there's certain subjects that I have uh, have collected over 40 you know plus years um, that no one else has and um, you know and historically I know that it's significant and that it serves a broader purpose other than just having a bunch of stuff in a bunch of boxes and files uh, it's an end in turn, I've tried to make books out of those so that um, what I've discovered uh, then becomes public information. I don't want to hoard it. I don't want to have it in a box. I don't want to hide it. I don't want to, you know, it has to be shared. That that really is something that's really uh, the, the heart of what it is that my collecting, you know, mentality is all about. 
When I kind of ended officially my studio time in the early uh, 2000s um, and focused strictly working for Toshin, then, you know, those collections became the core of what I was doing for Toshin uh, in terms of publishing books and still is to this day. So all of that stuff, you know, works its way into books for, uh, primarily for Toshin. throwing stuff out or at the flea market, someone will say, ah, no, 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 we can't throw that away. You know, I saw that in a book. Seven years ago, uh, an, an intern at Tosh, and uh, I pulled him once he was done with his internship and said, do you want to work for me? And he said, yes. And so for seven years, he's been uh, documenting and, and scanning and databasing the stuff. And after seven years, he's probably through about 20% of the collection. Ben and I were talking about ideas to do for books. And I said, you know, there's this guy who's probably in his 80s and he did like the, the coolest surfing photography in the 60s. And I think, you know, his work m could make really a great book because we had been working on a book with Julia Schulman, who was an architectural photographer. And Benick likes to work with older guys and kind of find these hidden uh, archives and bring them to the, to the forefront. And so I thought, man, yeah, you know, Grannis might be a really good person for him to you know, uh, take a look at. So I showed him the, the photos that I had still kept. And so I went down to Carlsbad and he was, he was in a trailer, uh, with his wife. And so we had a conversation. I said, you know, I work for this publishing company and would you be interested in maybe doing a book? And I was aware that he already had a book on his, uh, on his, uh, surfing photography, but it was done by, uh, surfers which was a little bit different than what I was thinking of because I saw in his photos, um, surfing culture, the skateboarding stuff and the, the fashion shots and the cars and all the other really kind of cool stuff from the sixties that most people related to, cause that was what people were looking at. This was kind of the key stuff. And so he said, yeah, we can do a book. So we put a deal together and uh, that book came out first and that was uh, highly successful. I guys who were surfers said, you know what? That's one of the best books on surfing that we've ever seen. And it's because it came from a perspective of someone who wasn't a surfer because you saw stuff that surfers aren't going to see. And I said, I knew what I was looking for. I mean, I knew exactly what I wanted that book to be. And I knew that Granis had this cool stuff that everybody who, if you're a surfer or not, you relate to that kind of stuff. So I hooked him up with a gallery in West Hollywood who started selling his prints for 3000 to $10,000 a piece. And so that was something I was very proud of in terms of taking this kind of obscure surfing photographer and who was living in a trailer and selling prints for, you know, 10, 15, 25 dollars to, uh, to a guy who was recognized as one of the, you know, pioneers of photography, surfing photography, and took him to a place that he was, he made, he made a lot, a lot of money and was recognized in a much wider scope uh, by people. The Getty uh, was thinking about buying his stuff. Um, he got a show, this show in West Hollywood was huge. Uh, he sold out. He got a full page in the New York Times. He got a full page in the LA Times. A gallery in New York picked him up and still sells his stuff. So it was, that was very satisfying to see this guy who was kind of a, uh, uh, you know, hidden from everybody and all of a sudden, you know, in, in the kind of twilight years of his life, uh, was recognized and made a, a lot of money and I, I, he, he died a happy guy.